cool. All right, what up, what up, what up, y'all? We are doing a white, uh, a white screen review. I called it once that yeah. we did a movie and it didn't really work. Um, <laughs> it's a silver screen review. It's not so much a review as a praising. We are just here to let y'all know that we loved Black Art in the Absence of Light, a beautiful documentary on HBO. I am here with, I am blessed by the presence of <laughs> our research consultant, Ed Carr. So I'm very happy to have him here to discuss yeah. this uh, documentary that we've already seen twice <laughs> at this point. Yeah, yeah. Um, plan to see it a lot more. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. I've already like told my school, I was like, so during study period for the next like two weeks, I'm going to mm. be showing a viewing of this documentary for our students. So whoever wants to join, it's cool, but. Yeah. That's what I'll be doing. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 a pretty good doc, so I'm not mm -hmm. surprised at all. Yeah, I mean, that. and it covers so much. So it pretty much covers 50 years of black art, like yeah. in a sense of 50 years, in a sense of like we actually are seeing the talking heads of artists from 50 years in the past, or at least working 50 years in the past, mm -hmm. and it starts around. Uh, two centuries of Black American art, um, a show that was held at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art in 1976, and it was curated by the art historian and artist David Driscoll, who RIP, shout out to a petty queen. Um, we love us, um, David Driscoll. <laughs> when you watch it, you'll know what we're talking about when we say petty. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. big, I love his energy. Um, and I guess I really just want to start by like just shouting out all of the amazing talking heads that they had. We don't want to do too much spoilers. We said this before, but like we just don't want to like we this is like a, a long ass advertisement, you all, for you to watch this. We're just not getting paid for it at mm -hmm. all. It's just like free yeah. advertisement. Like go watch it. it will just make, yeah, it will make you feel good. At the end, I felt proud. <laughs> like yeah. I wasn't even involved and I felt proud. <laughs> like, I was like, we've we've done a lot of work and yeah. we're gonna continue to make great work. So Yeah, it felt it felt yeah. great. But um I just wanted to shout out all the artists talking heads particularly, um, uh, because I would say like ninety-eight percent of them guys are like kingpins that we talked about in the past. So shout out to us. Um, but um just to talk about them, we have Betsy Sarr. Uh, we have David Driscoll, Glenn Ligon, Carrie James Marshall, Richard Mayhew, Stanford Biggers, Jordan Castile, Radcliffe ba um, Bailey, Kehinde Wiley, Amy, Amy Sherald, uh, who else is here? Faith Ringgold, Hank Willis Thomas, the, the Astor Gates, Carol Walker, Fred Wilson, Lydon Ashton Harris, uh, Lyle Ashton Harris, who else, who else, who else is that? That's like do the we, name. Do we give props oh, to Swiss Beats? Oh, Carry Way Memes. Who? Do we give props to Swiss Beats? For yeah, of course. Them? Swiss Beats shows up <laughs> and we get a great, great segment about, you know, collectors and the importance of collecting in the art world. So yeah. um, that was great to see. And like them just shouting out like the importance of hip hop artists supporting Black art is so vital because it shows like, who was it exactly? Valerie Oliver. She's, um, a the curator over at the Museum of Fine Arts in Virginia, I believe. Yeah. Um, she made the point of saying how important it is for Black artists, um, Black, well, just art to be collected and art to yeah. be seen as something that is, you know, it improves the quality of life. That's what she, mm -hmm. and like, that is just, with your yes, art. you should be living yeah. with art. It makes you feel better. And I feel like, yeah. especially during the time of like the big core, I'm like, come on, that is so true. Like yeah. I've, I've never collected art as much as I have done recently. I mean, mm -hmm. like given I'm in a financial situation where I can do that, but, um, and I am making kind of a little bit more I want to make a little bit more given the big core, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> but it is like just really um, important for there to be kind of like an imprint about like buy black art. And I think it was even more important. I think, oh, she also mentions Valerie Oliver was just on point. I know I'm gonna say not a big like, not a lot of spoilers, but um, check out Valerie Oliver. I know I am. 
Um, but she was talking about how many like exhibitions there are out now of like black artists and we should be celebrating that. And so many things have happened in the last 10 years, which they talk about and which is beautiful. Yeah. Um, but she says exhibitions are not, you know, acquisitions. They're not purchases by the museums. And we need to remember that, like just because these museums are including black art um in black exhibitions and those are often black traveling shows that doesn't mean the mm. museum bought all that work like i know we're praising yeah. the mfa for all their boss this boss yeah show but like let's yeah. look how yeah. much black art do does that institution own not that much yeah um mm -hmm. And I mean, like the work of like Fred Wilson, where he, you know, goes to museums and he goes through their um, amazing collections that aren't shown. And it's so cool to see how he, you know, rearranges and curates, um, you know, museum artifacts. And yeah, um, it's all just so. And yeah, and it's kind of starting to feel like, are the museums finally going to put enough finances behind acquiring like black mm -hmm. art? Mm -hmm. And I mean, will we see them in our museums or not? It's like, I guess TBD, like yeah. we'll see whether they do it or not. Yeah, I mean, Glenn Ligon mentions in there, like he he says he yeah. plays the game while he's in museums yeah. to see yeah. when black art was acquired and like seeing mm -hmm. how, like it's usually very recent. And yeah. uh, Swiss mentions too, like, oh, I'm sure a lot of museums are gonna start, you know, start selling off a lot of their, white art so they can acquire some black art um, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. we might see those shifts happening but uh you know when as us millennials are getting older i think that's when things like that is going to start happening mm -hmm. um yeah. when we're like 50 year olds then we'll start seeing those yeah. real things changing but i don't think it's going to happen like in the next decade i don't feel like those changes are going to happen yeah. it doesn't feel like that um yeah maybe the scale will probably get closer and closer to being balanced but mm -hmm. as to whether it will ever be balanced i guess only god knows yeah i don't feel that will happen anytime yeah. soon and i think in contrast to that they talk about the met show harlem on my mind um mm -hmm. that was uh put on at the met in 1968 there was little to no black artistship in this show it was very yeah. much a kind of anthropological uh kind of um yeah. representation of the space rather than an artistic mm -hmm. representation and it was all photographic and i thought yeah. it was very interesting how much the met's curator head director was like well i think it's good because our white curators tried and they said it was good. <laughs> yeah. Like that was pretty yeah. much. <laughs> and there was like, there was one uh, photographer, James Van Der Zee, mm -hmm. that was in it. And mm -hmm. you can, you could tell that like his images were much more emotional mm -hmm. than the other ones because it's like, it because he was like, a part of the community because exactly. they're aware of his presence. There's a difference when yep. you're taking pictures as a voyeur and that's essentially mm -hmm. what you are when you don't introduce yourself into a space. Yeah. And someone, I will just go on on a, a quick tangent real quick. Someone who studied sociology for four years with my, you know, um, undergraduate career i mm -hmm. had to do many many ethnographic studies where i had to go around to different communities and pretty much study what the fuck was going on there and during mm -hmm. that time i had to you know talk to people take photos but i didn't just sit there and secretly like take some photos and like write down their conversations no i got into the community introduce yeah. myself then i can make a real understanding and a real documentation of what's going on here and james mm -hmm. not only was he a part Part of that community so he could you know enter very excuse me i like i know him mr devleek <laughs> i'm talking like i know him <laughs> but anyways um uh he was able to take beautiful photos as, whereas these white photographers of the 60s were taking them as voyeurs that's pretty much all they were documentaries yeah. from far away taking photos of them like they're fucking nature shots and uh or like taking photos of like animals like doing whatever yeah. they want in the in the wild like that's pretty much how they were framed yeah. um so those two shows are kind of contrasted the 
plus, you know, two centuries of the Black American art in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And then they also bring up Feldman Goldman's uh, show, Black Male Representation of Masculinity. And that was held at the Whitney. And that was in the 90s. So 93, yeah. I think, 92. Yeah, 93, know. 94, I think. Yeah. yeah, maybe 94, maybe big ups in 94. My year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just wasn't there for that too bad um mm. but it was like a beautiful beautiful show it was super um like thought-provoking and out of the mainstream mm. and um it got you know artists like a Hindi Wiley thinking and you know being more open like now we have so many you know openly gay black artists and it's so awesome to see how they're able to you know uh just you know, talk and be and yeah. live and uh, exist. And um, to go on a tangent about the Kahindi Wiley, I thought it was, Kahindi is obnoxiously humble. Excuse me, sir. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Oh, when wow. they mentioned, hi Marshall. When they mentioned the him just doing Barack Obama's portrait and he's like, oh, and then they picked me like, shut up. What the fuck else is yeah. like, shut up, Candy. And then when he was like, and then I was honored to be a studio um, museum in Harlem resident, which those are all like big ups to all the studio museum residents yeah. because they did big stuff, which is Marshall, Castile, Wiley, mm -hmm. Biggers. Um, amazing, amazing artist. This guy was named after Kerry James Marshall. And um, he is clearly a rebel, like Mr. Kerry yeah. James Marshall. <laughs> and yeah. I, I just... Everything that Carrie James Marshall has said was just so so many gems. I feel like this this whole talk was just gems, gem dropping gems. It really was like <laughs> he, he really blew my mind with the black color palette, because like I I would have never thought about like having like a just black color palette. Mm -hmm. like, that's mm -hmm. wild. Mm -hmm. That was like different. Yeah, and he's talking about the different kinds of uh, black, yep. like yeah. black opposed to like, what, what? Like, I'm not a painter, so I feel like it's like, so it's it's amazing the way that these I, are. I was not ready for that. I mean, all of these artists are amazingly humble. Like the fact that yeah. like Amy Sherald, when they were talking about how she becomes a household name after she did the um, Michelle Obama um, portrait, and she was like, I'm just like grateful I get to pay off my student loans. <laughs> it's like, yeah, girl, that, like, that was real. That was that was so real. real. Like, <laughs> like I yeah. It's yeah. too much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's an like we can go on for days about this without spoiling. I do want to talk because it is Black History Month. They did open up my eyes to some black painters of the 1800s that I was very unaware of. And I, I blame every institution that I have ever gone to that has claimed to teach me about art. They have failed me because I do, I did not know about Joshua Johnson, an amazing portrait artist. I did not know about Edward Mitchell Bannister, a uh, landscape artist. I did not know about Robert Scott Duncanson, another amazing, uh, um, a landscape painter. And I want to, we can end, end this by thanking the Astor Gates <laughs> because yeah. in chronological order of how the movie, the documentation goes, or yeah, I guess that's, I do want to say that um, I really love the perspective that they gave Faith Rengold. Um, yeah. They really let her tell her story and they yeah. let her say, Romeo Bearden played me. Y'all yeah. love to be big ups to Romero, but like, yeah, yeah. He ain't shit, but a little collage, but he ain't, yeah. he ain't got the same like repertoire as me, but that's cute. That's cute that y'all yeah, think yeah. that. So and I they kind wanna... of, they kind of like, when she said that, it, was, it kind of got me thinking because it's like, people can be more than one thing. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, like Romero Bearden can be this amazing artist. But at the same time, he can have flaws and be sexist and basically like do what he did. Mm -hmm. So it's and kind of like in the end, it's kind of looking like at the whole collective of Spiral, which Spiral was a uh, art collective in the nineteen. Yeah, that was started in nineteen sixty three. Um, this was a uh, art collective we talked about on the show 
uh, maybe a year or so ago, maybe that last mm -hmm. Black History Month. Um, but it's an art collective that started really during the civil rights movement and Romeo Bearden and Norman Lewis were um, pretty much the kind of uh, um, beginners of that, founders of that organization. And they, were, they only let one woman in and it, it felt like yeah. there, there is definitely a, a patriarchy that wasn't really talked about nearly as much as like Faith was like, Hey y'all, <laughs> y'all realize that like, I'm yeah. here, I'm doing my shit. I'm doing it just as mm -hmm. good as y'all, if not better. And y'all are acting like I don't exist. And yeah. uh, um, like it was kind of said and like that was kind of it. And I think, yeah, I think that's in a lot of ways they kind of did that with a few of the talking heads, particularly Kara Walker. They were kind of like, yo, Kara Walker drops bombs. And we are not gonna say if we like her work or not. <laughs> Like, that's yeah. kind of like how they were. And I was yeah. like, what? Because I love me some Kara Walker. Yeah, on top of it, I love her voice, y'all. If y'all haven't heard Kara Walker speak, <laughs> her voice is so deep and I just love it. Oh my God. I got such a crush on her. Yeah. I have such a crush on her. Like, yeah. love that woman. But anyways, like I was saying, um, we can kind of end on Theaster. Um, the amazing Theaster Gates. Um, he was, I think, our second kingpin or third kingpin. Like, that's how serious he is to me. Um, I've heard him speak. He's been a, an amazing, amazing uh, inspiration to me. Um, and uh, he mentions the artist Dave Drake or Dave Potter Drake um, or Dave the Potter. Uh, he was born in the 1800s and passed away in the 1870s. He was a slave, so, you know, his dates don't really happened too much um he was um yeah he was born and lived in um edgefield south carolina and he was a master potter um as being someone from my family's from south carolina and i never heard of this man um it's outstanding to me he did, did pot it um po uh, he did pottery for over 50 years um and he also taught himself how to read and he fucking inscribed poetry and fucking couplets into his fucking pots. And I don't know if I'm related to Mr. Dave Drake and Drake is not his last name, obviously. That's his slate, that's the owner's name. Um, so let's just call him Dave the Potter. And I wanna thank the Aster for introducing me to this man. Um, I feel so much closer to my myself as a as a sculptor as a my lineage to South Carolina <laughs> and <laughs> I represent you as a like a black sculptor like it was crazy um and also I mean like the ending I mean the what he says we was really powerful it was so powerful I mean we posted it on the Instagram and we probably post that little clip in the show notes for this as well um as as well as this list of all these names because I will just list them for you all so you can just mm -hmm. find them because you should do deep dives into every one of these artists they only you only get to hear so much from them so you you gotta dig harder dig more yeah. um but um just are you willing to make in the absence of light um which which good, is but... my question for you like do you do you think that you make a lot of your work in the absence of light or is it driven more by the light yeah i think i do it in the absence of light because i've never wanted to i've never th thought of my art to make me famous i've never that's mm -hmm. never been the want for me um mm -hmm. i would say i've even taken more of a david driscoll type of <laughs> point and i kind of want to go more to the art history art curatorship um and um i don't know but i i it's a it's a hard it's a hard like obviously yeah. question to grapple with but i think it's a really mm -hmm. important one and to yeah. um yeah it's 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 so deep and it made me yeah. think forever and i'm getting a tattoo that says the absence of light because that's mm -hmm. how deep it is to me like i feel like it is what i do um i'm making i'm trying but it's not the goal necessary to be seen it's um mm. kind of to try to get others to look yeah yeah and it's it's weird because i mean i guess there's there's nothing wrong with either way 
but one of the things that also stood out from this doc was because what somebody had mentioned that when they saw Romare Bearden's work, they were like, oh, you should go in this direction. Mm -hmm. And so it seemed like he went in the, that direction. But I'm not sure if that's because he wanted to go in that direction or because for lack of, for in the case of this argument, the light was pushing him in that direction. Mm -hmm. So could we have gotten like even more different work from him? Like, I don't Probably. know, because I don't control time, but like, I mean, even with the light, he became such a huge monumental figure. So mm -hmm. it's like, that's like Basquiat too. Good. Yeah. I wonder what Basquiat's work would we still see, you know? Yeah. Would mm -hmm. we still be, would he just be a street artist if, you yeah. know, he never met and got yeah. in contact with the artist he did? But um, mm -hmm. amazing film, amazing doc. And uh, very much at the end, it feels like a to be continued type of life. And that's what. Yeah. That's a black artist right now. It's definitely in a to, can be, to be continued um, type of situation. And um, I can't wait to see what what's next. And um, yeah, it's a beautiful film. Watch it, watch it, watch it. That's it. I have no yeah. criticisms, really. <laughs> yeah, I have. A, no, that's it. It was great. I want a part two. That's it. And a part four, a part three, part four, and a part five. Oh. Okay, that's it. <laughs> All right. Well, that was our praise. Uh, I hope you all liked it and I hope you all uh, watch it and uh, let us know what you think. Yeah. All right. Peace, y'all. Bye. See ya.